I kept coming back and looking at the archive from the photographs I did of, of Moscone in the late 70s, early 80s. And I kept thinking, like, what would happen if, if those photographs actually became a, a permanent part of the site, like embedded into the walls? And I, like, in other words, that, that they were returning to the same place that they were originally conceived of. And that's what made me think about working in granite or stone. And as I looked at the three-dimensional modeling of that station, I realized when you can't come up from the escalator, you're, you're going to have there's quite a, um, um, an allay, if you will, that you could really do something with those walls. So I set about trying to learn how to work with photographs in an extremely large scale and etch them onto granite and still have them maintain a very kind of photographic quality to them. I made those photographs when I was a very young woman, probably in my late 20s, early 30s, in the exact same place that they're being installed in now. So there's something very poetic about this cycle of having made those while they were in construction, and now they're, they're actually images of the construction embedded in stone now in the subway. So this piece is, um it's, it's part of a series that I did of all, except for this one, smaller pieces for gallery exhibitions um, that are all images of pyrite or fool's gold. Um, and I had been working with that subject matter for a little while, and so it seemed like a great opportunity to scale that idea up because it's already a lot about scale. So the piece is based on a, a a scan using just like a consumer scanner of a, a piece of pyrite, fool's gold, which is really reflective. And so the scanner, um, because it's so reflective, the RGB sensors in the scanner created all these um, like rainbow colors. It references like the, the various gold rushes of San Francisco, the geological gold rush, the tech gold rush and cultural gold rush, you might say, um, of people flocking to the city for different reasons at different periods in time. And then it also references geological time because it is this like uh, mineral image. Um, so it references both deep time and civilizational time, which is sort of a theme in my work in general. Um, and it's also meant to be kind of a th like a threshold as people walk underground, like they make this passage from above ground to underground. If you think of the long lineage of, of, uh, of California landscape and, and all the grandeur and the beautiful landscapes um, by Ansel Adams and, and Wynne Bullock and, and all of those people, in many ways I saw myself as this young woman who was now kind of excavating what the urban landscape was talking about, who we are as a culture, what are our aspirations, what does this mean, this, this huge, this huge hole in the ground that's being unearthed and I was particularly intrigued I was particularly intrigued with the fact that this building was going to be a series of 26 columnless arches and the arch to me just on an architectural level is such a powerful form I mean when you think about it the arch connects two pieces of two places in the landscape and you have to get from point A and create that arch in order to ground it in point B. So there was something I thought just very significant about arches, creating arches. And in many ways, we, we were titling this project Arc Cycle for a long time um, until we've, we haven't even yet finalized that title. The title Face CZ is just, um, as with all the other pieces, the smaller gallery works in this series where I use different sides of, of these pyrite rocks. So each side that I put on the scanner is like a face of the rock. And I named the different pieces in that series. Each one is face and a letter. And it's just a letter that I thought the angles of the, the sort of crystalline growth look like, just purely subjectively. So there's a face K, there's a, a face E. And it's very unscientific. It's sort of an, I think it's a funny w way to play with this idea of like a mineral specimen and this kind of classification but it's just it's a very subjective and almost like emotional response to this rock and like everything that it can be.
it's sort of a little play on that, that like the scientific and artistic divide. In many ways, the people who have followed my work or people who see my work, they often say that after looking at the photographs, they realized that they had been seeing something that was invisible to them. And yet, the banal subjects that I often photograph, whether it's architecture or construction site or wood blocks um, or classrooms, we have access to all of that. But I'm trying to photograph these and, and frame them in ways in which the invisible becomes seen. I'm very interested in, in the quotidian experience of, uh, and material culture of the banal because it is so much a part of our lives. So I'm, I'm always kind of struck when people write me or, or say something to me that the work changed the way that they see and that it's helped them kind of reckon with the times and the place that they live. Public art is an opportunity to work in a really different way. I specifically, I guess, have this philosophy of, of not trying to tell, almost like not trying to operate on the level of language that advertising does, um, which means not giving an easy meaning for something, not telling, not giving people all the information so that they don't have to think about what this is trying to say to them. And that's why the materiality coming to the forefront is a way to speak. It's almost like the way that nature might be said to speak, you know? It's like if you go, go out, if you go hiking on a mountain, you know, I think it's a common experience for people to feel like they're being almost like spoken to in a, a language that is not words. Uh, it's, it's more like the way your body feels and the way the light does what the light does.